Everyone had a good time opening presents already? No? Right, waiting till after church. That's good. Hallelujah. Father, as we come to your word this morning, we ask, as always, for your anointing on to be on the word, an anointing that lifts the veil from our eyes and from our hearts, that we might, every time we hear your word, that we might get a clearer view of Jesus. And we ask it in his name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Christmas and the mystery of godliness. Christmas and the mystery of godliness. I did have my little thing with some of it. It doesn't matter. So if you have your Bibles, please follow the scriptures. Uh, the first verse we're reading this morning, uh, 1 Timothy 3 and verse 16, beyond all question, the mystery of godliness is great. He appeared in a body, was vindicated by the Spirit, was seen by angels, was preached among the nations, was believed on in the world, was taken up in glory. And then 1 Timothy uh, chapter 6, that was 1 Timothy 3, 16, and then 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 to 14. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin uh, and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. But you, man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. In the sight of God, in the sight of God who gives life to everything, and of Christ Jesus, who while testifying before Pontius Pilate made the good confession. I charge you to keep this command without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now we've all heard of the standard athletic races. Who can, who can call out some of the races that you will have at the Olympics, for instance? 100 meters? 200? 400? 800s, we're going up, 1,500, the triathlon, you have the steeplechase, 3,000, 5,000, 10,000, so you have all these, you have all these races, then the marathon, and then of course the triathlon, anyone here ever done a triathlon? Joseph has, isn't it? where's Joseph? In the crash, Joseph has done a triathlon. There are also some pretty tough races that we don't often hear about. There's a, a, like the Comrades Marathon in South Africa. The Comrades Marathon is run over 96 kilometers. That's two, the length of two marathons done over, ni uh, over uh, 96 kilometers. And then there's the Hard Rock Endurance Run in Colorado in which you have 48 hours to complete 100 miles on roads and dirt trails and up and down valleys and mountain peaks. And one of the toughest races of all 
It's called the Backyard Ultra. Has anyone here ever heard of the Backyard Ultra? No? As you can see, I have never run any of these races. Okay, so <laughs> the Backyard Ultra start, sounds easy to start with. Competitors have to run a cross-country lap of 4.167 miles in one hour. You say, oh, that's easy peasy. I could do that. Wait, wait. That's not the whole race. You have to keep doing one of those laps every hour, every hour until there's only one person left doing a lap. So the race has been known to last four days and 400 miles until there was one person left standing. That's the Backyard Ultra. And then there are some truly wacky races from around the world. There is, in Australia, cane toad racing in Port Douglas. Now that is a cane toad. And in the cane toad racing, you have to kiss a cane toad, which has toxic skin, of course. You have to kiss the cane toad, then put it on the table and blow a party horn at it and to see whose toad jumps off the table first. The winner is given an antidote for warts, as you can imagine. Then there is, uh, it's not just the Australians who can be wacky, we can be wacky. There's the annual cheese rolling race in Gloucester. Uh, competitors chase a nine pound cheese down a hill. And it always ends in total chaos with people rolling and falling the hill, down the hill and, and so on. And then you get things like there's uh, a, Robot camel racing in Dubai. They have developed, uh, because they were worried about using child jockeys, so they've developed robot jockeys to race their camels. And going back to Australia, you have cockroach racing. And there's hundreds of people turn up for these events and uh, to race their cockroaches. It's, it's quite fun. You get in Birmingham, the National Pantomime Horse Nationals <laughs> with pantomime horses racing. And my favorite, or might be my favorite, I've not actually tried it, the annual wife carrying world championships, <laughs> which are held in Finland. And uh, <laughs> com competitors, competitors, have to carry their partners over a 250 meter obstacle course, the partner cannot weigh less than 108 pounds. Now, I considered doing a demonstration of this <laughs> for you today. Marianne's okay, it's my knees won't hold up. So <laughs> but I did think as the annual ones are in Finland that maybe we could ask Patrick and Saya. <laughs> for a demonstration this, this Christmas morning. <laughs> what, you may be wondering, has all this got to do with the mystery of godliness? And where does Christmas fit into the picture? When you look closely at what Paul had to say about the mystery of godliness in that passage we read this morning, you realize that Paul is presenting it as a race. It's clear that he saw it as a race. He saw it as the race of your life, as the most important race you would ever be in, in your life. Let's take a closer look. Firstly, every race has to have a course marked out. You can't say it's a race and just, well, where's the course? Well, there is no course. Every race has to have a course marked out. Now, you have to remember that Paul wasn't just writing a personal letter to Timothy. He wasn't just, you know, having a, a chit-chat with Timothy. When you look at uh, First Timothy at the beginning, if you, if you want to go there in your Bibles, First Timothy... And chapter 1, verse 
1 Timothy chapter 1, uh, verses 3 to 6. As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, this is, this is Paul writing to Timothy, and he says, as I urged you when I went into Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus so that you may command certain people not to teach false doctrines any longer or to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. Such things promote controversial speculations rather than advancing God's work, which is by faith. The goal of this command is love, which comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Some have departed from these and have turned to meaningless talk. In other words, some have strayed from the course. Some have got off course. And Paul is writing to Timothy and telling them, telling him how to advise the Ephesian church to stay on course or to get back on course. They were wandering or off track. Now, this, this theme is, is particular to uh, uh, Ephesus. We find that Jesus also wrote to the church at Ephesus. In uh, Revelation 2 and verse 4, in the seven letters to the seven churches, uh, when Jesus writes in chapter 2 and verse 4 of Revelation, he says uh, to the Ephesian church, you've lost your first love. Repent and come back and do what you were doing at the beginning. In other words, get back on course. Get back on course. Get back on track. You see, as Paul is writing to, to Timothy here, as in the verses we read earlier, uh, he's saying in so many words, it's easy to get distracted by things. When we are following Jesus and living our lives, it's easy to get distracted. For instance, by money. It's not, money is not the problem. It's the love of money when people are only pursuing it to the exclusion of all other things. It's the love of money. The desire for earthly things can sidetrack you. People get sidetracked by, by desire for earthly things, uh, desire, they're sidetracked by conspiracy theories, sidetracked by petty arguments. So easy to stray off course when your passion for earthly things is greater than your passion for Jesus. So Paul writes to Timothy, he says, this is how you've got to advise the guys to stay on course. He says, flee such things in the verses we read later. Flee such things. Pursue, that's chase, that's follow, righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, gentleness. He says, fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life for which you were called. And in Hebrews 12 and verse 1. And in Hebrews 12 and verse 1. It says, throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And run with perseverance the race marked out for you. So in other words, Paul is saying... All these things that tangle you up and just pull you down and distract you and sidetrack you, put them aside, flee from them, get on course, get on track, come back on track. You need to rekindle, he's saying in so many words, you need to rekindle the fire of your first love, your passion for Jesus and get back on track. The second thing, that we see here that marks this out as a, as a race. And we can see that Paul is saying that godliness is a race. The second thing is that every race, every race has a start and finish line. Now this is where Christmas comes in. Because in the verses we read, in, in describing the mystery of godliness, Paul starts with Jesus appearing in a body. He says, the mystery of godliness is great. He appeared in a body. There's his starting point. There's his starting point. He appears in the body. When Jesus was born in Bethlehem, when the word became flesh and dwelt among us, it signaled the start of the race for godliness. 
The first step in God's plan of redemption, the beginning of his plan to save us. And the mystery of godliness that began with his first appearing will end with his second appearing. You read there in 1 Timothy 6, verses 13 to 14, Paul writes, having said that the mystery of godliness is great, he appeared in the body. When he gets to the end in 1, chapter, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 13, he says, I charge you to keep this command without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. The first coming of Jesus at Christmas, the first advent marked the start of the race, the beginning of the mystery of godliness. The second advent, the return of Jesus will mark the end of the race. That's when it's finished. Hebrews 9 and verse 28 says this, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people and he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him, to complete the redemption story for those who are in the race, <laughs> to bring them to the completion. My friends, this age that we are living in will not continue ad infinitum. It won't just be an eternal cycle of boom and bust and good times and bad and war and peace, live, life, death, repeat. It's not just going to go on and on and on, on and on. The significance of Christmas, the first advent, is that it promises it will be followed by the second advent. The first appearing will be followed by the second appearing. That's the promise. It will come. It will come. That's when the race will end. The third thing that Paul is saying here and pointing out that marks the mystery of godliness as a race is every race requires a particular skill set. Some races demand speed, like Usain Bolt, Others, stamina, like the guys who do these ultra marathons and comrades marathons and things. The mystery of godliness is not a sprint. Turn to the person next to you and say, it's not a sprint. It's not a sprint. It's about enduring. It's about endurance, lasting the course, overcoming obstacles, along the way and the duration of this race is a lifetime it's a lifetime it's your lifetime in hebrews 12 verse 1 we read it earlier but going back to it paul says run with perseverance and that word the greek word translated perseverance there can mean endurance patience hopefulness cheerfulness but keep going the end will come the end will come philippians 3 verses 13 and 14 says this paul says uh, brothers i do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it but one thing i do forgetting what is behind straining to what is ahead I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. It's an endurance race. It's an endurance race. Paul says, there's lots that's gone behind, but I'm still pressing on. I haven't got there yet. Paul, you're the apostle Paul. You've done so much. You've written all these letters. You've got such understanding. You, you know so much about Jesus, so many miracles. He says, I haven't got there yet. But the end is in sight. <laughs> He's pressing on. Paul fixed his eyes on Jesus, says in uh, Hebrews uh, 12 in verse 2, it goes on, says, fixing your eyes on Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith. And that leads us on neatly onto the fourth point.
every race has a prize. Every race has a prize. Something that you are hoping to win. Otherwise, you wouldn't enter. The prize, my friend, that you are running for is Jesus himself. Just as God said to Abraham right at the beginning, Abraham, it's me. I'm your great reward. The prize you're running for is Jesus. Not wart antidote, not muddy cheese round, but Jesus. 1 John 2 and verse 3. John wrote this, Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself. You know what John is saying here? Just as he is pure, you know what John is saying here? He's saying, we all started the race at the first appearing of Jesus. And we know the second appearing is coming. And we don't quite know what we're going to look like. But we do know this, that when he appears, we're going to look just like him. Because that's the prize. Because that's the prize that we're running for. And everyone who has this hope purifies himself. And there's the element there, uh, going back to the previous point of perseverance. If that's your hope, you keep going because you know you're going to get there. You know you're going to have the greatest prize of all, which is Jesus himself. Wonderful. Colossians 3. I wonder why this thing takes two clicks to respond. (laughs) Colossians 3 and verse 4. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. When that second appearing comes, you will appear with him in glory. 2 Timothy 4 and verse 8. Now there is in store for me, Paul wrote to Timothy in the second letter, Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. For all who have longed, who've yearned, who've hoped, who've persevered, who've kept going, waiting for his appearing, knowing that when he appears, you're going to look like him, knowing that he is the prize. And that, says Paul, at that point, you get your crown of righteousness. Which the Lord awards to you then. And so, my friends, the mystery of godliness is the race of your life that began with the coming of Christ, will end with his return. And our challenge is to stay in the race From the first appearing to the second appearing. To stay the course. From Christmas to the conclusion. To finish the course. To win the prize. In Titus 2, Paul writes another letter to Titus. And for once he's not writing about the Ephesian church. But he writes to Titus and he says in verses 11 to 14, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. There's Christmas. There's your starting line. There's the under starters orders. (laughs) For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. You see, it's grace that teaches us. Not threat, not just law, but the grace and the goodness and the forgiveness of God that teaches us. His love teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ, 
who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. You see, my friends, that the mystery of godliness, first of all, the word godliness is actually a contracted form of God-likeness. God-likeness. And in Greek, the word mystery is not something hidden, but something revealed. In Greek, the word means not something kept hidden, but something that was hidden and is revealed. In other words, the mystery of godliness is quite simply God's plan to restore you to his image, to transform you into the likeness of his son. He activated the plan at his first coming, at the first coming of Jesus, and he will draw the plan to an end at the second coming of Jesus. And he is the prize that we get. So let this first appearing that we're celebrating at Christmas today remind you and encourage you that there's going to be a second appearing. And that is the great prize. And my friends, stay on the course. You know what they do? I'm gonna, uh, we're going to sing a carol to close. Um, and hopefully some of the words in this carol uh, towards the end will just resonate with you in light of what we've been saying in the word this morning. But um, we're, we're going to sing this carol. But what I want to do is just pray, uh, pray for us. Uh, and uh, you know when they have races especially these long races, they have water stations. Uh, and, and you can, you know, while you're running, go and grab a bottle and, and you see them and they're, and they're pouring the water all over themselves and have a shower on the way. <laughs> and, you know, we have, we have the Holy Spirit to refresh us, to keep us going. And I want to pray for us that today would have been a water stop for you in this race of your life. Shall we stand? Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, what a prize. What a prize that we should be like you, restored to the image of Jesus, I thank you, Father. I thank you for the great prize. I thank you that you are our stamina, that you give us the strength. You've given us precious promises and everything that we need pertaining to life and godliness, that we might press on, that we might persevere, that we might make it from the first appearing to the second appearing and win that great prize. I thank you, Father, for everyone here today. And Lord, I just wanna pray and include myself in this prayer. We ask for the refreshing of your spirit to refresh us and bless us this day, this Christmas day, that we might sense a new strength, that we might have a new stamina uh, from the word of God and from the spirit of God, that we might have a new, a new strength and a renewed energy to keep going for you, Lord, and to keep chasing after you and pursuing you. Lord, we're longing for your return, looking for your return, waiting and yearning for your return, for your appearing. And Father, we thank you that in this race, with you, we win. With you, we win, and it's you we win. And so, Father, I pray for a touch of the refreshing of the Holy Spirit, that just as a runner would douse himself with water at a water station, that today, Lord, we would be doused in the refreshing flow of the Holy Spirit, that, Lord, that you, your life would flow into us, and that, Lord, that, that we would be encouraged to keep our eyes fixed on you, Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. The Lord bless you, my brothers and sisters, the Lord bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 We're going to sing. Um, thank you, musician, musicians. And uh, our last carol.
them every blessing that you can think of.